than an eight, but anyway. Right, um, we're looking at grace this morning. Uh, I've called the message Transforming Grace. It's, it's a word, grace, that comes so easily to our lips. It's a key attribute of God, a defining feature of our faith. But do we really understand it? By the way, I am going to read the passage in a moment. It's just an in, <laughs> uh, introductory remark. Do we really understand it? We know, of course, that God shows grace to all people in a general sense. He makes his sun shine. Oh, sorry, makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He gives life and breath to everyone, whether they acknowledge him or not. Theologians call this common grace because it applies to all people without distinction. Special grace, on the other hand, refers to the blessings that are received through faith in Christ. Forgiveness of sin, adoption into God's family, uh, uh, possession of the Holy Spirit, and so on. This, I would imagine, is what comes most readily to our mind when we hear the word grace, and rightly so. We, we rejoice to know that we have been saved by grace, spared the judgment that we deserve, and showered with undeserved blessings. We hear this message every week. We proclaim it every week in our songs and prayers. We cling to it in hard times. And all of that is great. What we perhaps need to be reminded of, however, is that this is not the whole story. The story does not end here. There's a whole other dimension to God's grace that we will miss if we, if we focus purely on salvation. So if you've got a Bible, then I invite you to turn with me to Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Titus 2, verses 11 to 14, and I'm reading from the ESV. So the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. You're going through a series on Titus at the moment, so you'll know, of course, that whereas in other letters, Paul begins in exposition of the gospel and then moves to application, how must we live in the light of all this, here in Titus, he begins with practical and ethical instruction and then takes a step back to consider what the basis of this new life is. Namely, the grace of God that has brought us out of darkness and into light. So that's the background of today's passage. I've got four simple points today. Grace has appeared. Grace saves. Grace trains. And grace prepares. Firstly, grace has appeared. By the way, is it something I'm doing that's producing this echo? Not sure. Oh well. Um, for, the, for the grace of God has appeared. Now, don't misunderstand. Grace is not a New Testament invention or discovery. You know, this is a surprisingly common idea, isn't it, that God was an ogre and a monster in the Old Testament. And then somewhere during the intertestamental period, you know, he attended an alpha course and straightened himself up and became a nice Christian God in the new. Despite what you may hear, God is described in the Old Testament as merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 
forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Think of some examples. Adam and Eve sinned, yet they were allowed to live. God's people were unfaithful, yet he remained faithful to them. David lusted, coveted, stole, fornicated, lied and killed, all in one go. Yet God forgave and restored him. I could go on, but the point is clear. God has always been gracious to his people. So what does Paul mean when he says the grace of God has appeared? Well, firstly, it has appeared visibly. Jesus Christ is the perfect revelation of God and the literal embodiment of his grace. And secondly, it has appeared in its fullness. God withheld judgment on the occasions that I've referred to, overlooked the sin of Adam and Eve, David and countless others, in anticipation of the day when he himself would bear sin's penalty in the person of his son. Adam and Eve were clothed in animal skins in anticipation of the day when Christ would take their sin and they would be clothed with his righteousness. David was spared death, the penalty for sin, in anticipation of the day when Jesus Christ, the righteous one, would die for the unrighteous. Every display of grace prior to the cross has been a shadow of the reality, a down payment on the promise, and now, in Christ, the promise has been fulfilled. And so, in that sense, the grace of God has appeared. So that's the first point that Paul makes. Grace has appeared in Christ. Secondly, grace saves. So the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, clearly, not all people are actually saved. So what does this mean? Well, if we look at the preceding verses, we see that Paul has just listed various groups of people, older men, older women, younger women, younger men and slaves, to whom he gives instruction. Each group receives its own particular set of instructions. So all people in this immediate context means all types of people. Young and old, male and female, slave and free. Anyone, no matter who or what they are, can receive the salvation that Christ offers. Don't forget that for Paul, this is no mere theological belief. It's a matter of deep personal experience. Saul, the violent persecutor of God's church, has become Paul the Apostle. And God's grace is the same today. When we turn on the news and see terrible atrocities being carried out in various parts of the world, we take comfort in the fact that sin will one day be judged. But we rejoice also in the fact that no person is beyond the reach of God's grace. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon received. Salvation is for all. But the story doesn't end there. Salvation is merely the gateway to God's blessing. Grace saves, but it also trains. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. This may not sound immediately like a work of grace, but I assure you it is. And to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. This is the second stage of God's grace, of, of God's special grace that I referred to in my introduction. One that we don't talk about as often. God, in his grace, doesn't just forgive our sin. He takes away the love of sin itself. 
Think about it. Every God-hating sinner from Vladimir Putin to the leader of Hamas wants to escape judgment, but they don't want to forsake their sin in order to do so. The nature of conversion is that we receive a new spirit, a new heart, a new nature that hates sin as much as God does and that longs to be free of it. This is a lifelong process and it involves two stages, two continual stages. Renouncing sin and pursuing godliness. Paul says that we renounce ungodliness, first of all, disregard of God, whether flagrant or casual, whether obvious or subtle. You know, the person who lives an outwardly good life but does so without any regard for God is just as ungodly in this sense as the blatant offender. So we renounce ungodliness by submitting to Christ in all things, living all of our lives under his authority and for his glory. And we renounce worldly passions, <coughs> sinful desires, cravings and inclinations of the flesh, which are the root of all sin. You can hear, can't you, the overtones of Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So we renounce these things and we pursue a life that is, firstly, self-controlled, upright and godly, the very opposite of our former ways, and that is focused on loving service of others. Verse 14, we are to be zealous for good works, since love of God and love of neighbour go hand in hand. Jesus served God and fulfilled his Father's mission by giving himself for the world. And we, in the same way, must give ourselves for others in ultimate service of God. And this is all possible because of the new life that God has brought us into by his grace. Christianity is not just a list of rules or a set of ethical instructions. It's a new life brought about graciously by the sovereign spirit of God. And this can be manifested in the most small, seemingly insignificant ways. You know, if I choose at work not to participate in, uh, you know, not, not to participate in a, a conversation which is putting someone else down behind their back, if I choose not to partake of gossip, in other words, I'm doing so not just because there's a rule that says don't gossip, but because I know that that is a sinful desire, a sinful craving of my flesh that I am now free to renounce and have the power to renounce in the pursuit of godliness. If I, if I choose not to give in to impatience or frustration or whatever it might be, the same principle applies. We are continually, whether we notice it or not, living out our new life in Christ by his grace. So grace saves, grace trains, and grace prepares. <coughs> Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope. This is the attitude and posture that God produces in us by his grace. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to grasp the magnitude of this. Paul says that we are looking forward to the return of Christ. That's what we long for above all things. But for those outside of Christ, the fact of his return is bad news. 
You know, there's a, there's a fantastic children's song that we used to sing a lot. It says, good news, Jesus was born, good news. He died on the cross, good news. He rose again, good news. And for the Christian, that's wonderful. It's a great song. But for, for those outside of Christ, it's bad news because it means that judgment is imminent. The only way of escape is through and in Jesus. You know, sometimes in the Old Testament, people had to be in a particular place in order to receive promised salvation. Noah's Ark, houses marked by the blood of the Passover lamb, Rahab's house, etc. This still applies today, albeit spiritually rather than physically. God promises salvation from his wrath to those who are in Christ to those who are sheltered by his saving grace. So we, since we are in Christ, no longer fear judgment. But more than that, we actively look forward to Christ's return. It's not just an absence of fear that God has produced in us. It's an eager expectation and longing. Because for us, this is the day when his glory will be revealed. It's no longer the day on which his wrath will be poured out. It's the day on which his glory will be revealed. And this is the basis of everything that Paul instructs us to do in the preceding verses and the last chapter. This is the basis of our entire new life as Christians. Whereas... Whereas prior to our conversion, whenever that was, Jesus was, for us, just a historical figure. He was either a pious irrelevance or a mere historical figure to be admired from afar. You know, like Winston Churchill or Martin Luther King or that Mahatma Gandhi or, 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 or whoever. Someone to be admired and appreciated, maybe even emulated at best. You know, he was an incredibly wise and loving man who people treated wickedly. But that's all he is in the eyes of the world. Now, by his spirit, God has opened our eyes to the truth of who Christ is. He, he has appeared to us. Remember that Paul says at the beginning of this passage, for the grace of God has appeared. Of course, he meant that in a literal sense, that God had come visibly into the world in Christ. But we too have, in a spiritual sense, glimpsed and beheld the glory of God in the face of Christ. We have seen his love that brought him down to earth and took him ultimately to the cross to die on our behalf and bear our sins. We see his glory in every sense. We are captivated by it and we live for it. And that provides the basis and the motivation for our forsaking sin. Because we glimpse the glory of Christ and we long to glimpse it fully and ultimately at his return and to live in it for all eternity. And we know, of course, that we can't live in a way that displeases him in this life and have him in the next. We can't live for sin in this life and have Christ's glory in the next. And that's not a threat, rather it's a promise. You know, uh, a woman, uh, a young woman who is engaged to be married to the most eligible bachelor in the land will not find it difficult to resist the charms of other men. And in the same way, we resist the charms of sin and are increasingly unsusceptible or intersceptible, whichever it is, to those charms because we are captivated by the greater glory of Christ. This is what grace has accomplished for you if you're a Christian this morning. You have been saved. You are being trained to forsake the passing pleasures of sin. 
and you are eagerly longing for the glory of Christ in which you will live for eternity. You see how, as I said, God's grace is so much bigger than just the forgiveness of our sins. It has brought us into a new life that will be culminated when Christ returns. So how do we draw all of this together? You know, that, that reminds me of work. We, we have an alarm that's continually going off at work, and I swear I hear it in my sleep. But anyway, <laughs> uh, colleagues say the same. How do we draw all of this together? As we go into a new year, let me encourage you and exhort you to commit yourself afresh to this gracious and glorious Christ. What could God do with individuals and with a church that pursued Christ and his glory with the same vigour and intentionality with which we pursue New Year's resolutions, like getting that promotion or running the London Marathon or whatever it might be. What could God do with a church that pursued Christ in the same way? So let me encourage you as we go into 2024 to live in the light of God's glorious grace. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Keep looking to him. Keep looking ahead to that day when he will return and God's grace will be consummated. Seek him in his word. Commune with him in prayer. Cultivate the fellowship of his people. Cry out for the sustaining power of his spirit and hold on to the promise of 1 John 3, verse 2, which summarises everything that I've been speaking about. That when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Lord, may every single one of us be captivated afresh by that promise. Commit ourselves to it again. And may we all ultimately see it fulfilled. Amen.